Discord. All right, everybody, for the recording's sake, I'm going to repeat myself just for continuity. Today's masterclass is about sales meetings. And sales meetings or mandatory meetings in general aren't typically something that our agents and staff get excited about. So today, we want to talk about some ideas on how to create sales meetings that are more engaging and truly help our agents move the needle forward with their business. So first, I want to hear from you. How frequently are you holding sales meetings and what day and time? So I used to hold mine on the first and third Tuesdays from 9 to 1030. So if you want to shout out or throw it in the chat, when are you currently holding your sales meetings? I'll speak since, since no one else is. We do ours uh, weekly on Wednesdays uh, okay. from 9.45 to 11. Okay, weekly on Wednesdays. Anybody else have a cadence for your once a week or an hour? Perfect. Good. All right. <laughs> Scott's not holding sales meetings. So Scott, this is going to be so great for you. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We know you're holding sales meetings. So the first uh, topic I want to cover, I sort of broke this into three parts today. So first is preparing for your meeting. Uh, the second part is content and structuring your actual meeting. And then the third piece is beyond the meeting. So first, preparing for our meeting. We want to send out any housekeeping items or reminders that you've previously covered in advance, either via email or a quick video. And you want to make sure that you're giving everyone 24 hours or so to have a chance to read or watch what you sent them. So what you don't want to do is send this out at 4 p.m. or later the day before and expect to have it done in the morning. So be, we're all in real estate. There's never any time off, we know, but get, set people up for success. Make sure that you're giving them ample time, at least 24, 48 eight hours to digest what you sent to them. And what this will do is re reserve your sales meeting time for new information and really interacting with your agents. And then at the sales meeting, spend a few minutes at the beginning of the meeting to make sure I'm taking off my socks in case you're wondering what you're doing. I always get really warm when I do these. <laughs> and so my, my morning frigidness is all of a sudden out the window, but that's that's the last article of clothing I'll take off for this call, I promise. All right, so we're gonna spend a few minutes during the meeting making, oh good, Curtis missed that. Sorry that he missed that aside for me. So we're gonna spend a few minutes during the meeting making sure that everyone consumed the information that we sent out. And we're gonna make sure that they have a chance to, uh, they understood what you sent out. And that way that's gonna reduce your housekeeping time during your meetings to about five minutes. The next thing we wanna to do to prep for our meeting is to create an agenda. And having a solid plan for your meeting really should be a non-negotiable. So does anyone else already create an agenda for your meetings? And if you do, do you share it beforehand with your team? No agenda. No agenda, okay. Do, so for Josh, do you share your agenda with your team beforehand? We do not because I don't want them to see um, the agenda and feel like it might not be valuable to them and then just decide that they have COVID that day and don't want to attend. So uh, we kind of keep that, that those cards close to our chest. Good. And it's I, not, it's by no means like a over the top agenda. It's just a Google slide with bullet points on it. Okay, good. I never shared agendas with my team either for the same reason. I kind of like when people are prospecting, they read through ad nauseum through the contact card and follow up boss, and they're really looking for a reason not to call the lead. And so I didn't sort of in your frame of mind, I don't want to set them up for any reason to go, oh, well, I already know how to do that. So I'm not going to come. So I, I do think you should start creating an agenda for your meetings. But I personally wouldn't share them with my team for that reason. But I know there, there's a lot of people out there that do share the agenda. Agenda, especially if they want them to prepare for the meeting in any way or, you know, come with your thoughts, come prepared to share that type of thing. So I can kind of see it both ways. I just um, didn't 
that's what I chose to do. Another way to prep for our meeting is to establish your expectations for the meeting. And this doesn't have to be done before every single meeting, but I would suggest clarifying this with your team. So if you haven't done this before, I would clarify it with everyone on your team. And then as you bring on new agents and staff, fill them in on how you run your meetings and then have reminders every so often. So some expectations might be, I'm gonna start on time and end on time every time. Uh, communicating these items in advance and your commitment to a regular start and stop time, that helps, let, that helps them to plan their day because if you're consistently going over on your time, it's hard to book appointments and showings and things like that beyond the time. And it makes them, especially since we don't love going to mandatory meetings anyway, it makes them sort of begrudge coming to them. Well, how long is she gonna keep us here today? That type of thing. So some other expectations might be that we're going to start on time and end on time. We're going to have one conversation at a time that limits your side conversations that you're gonna have during your meeting. Everyone's expected to give their full attention and to participate where appropriate. Uh, what, are some other, what are some other expectations you might set for your meetings beyond the things I listed? Anything, Curtis? Uh, I found it, I mean, it's not really a punitive measure, but it certainly does help accountability. If you are not on a meeting, whether it be the daily sales huddle or the weekly meeting, uh, mm -hmm. you are cut off for the time frame until the next occurring one. So we have everybody attends Tuesday because that's a whole week turnaround and everybody's on the Friday. So they still get their leads over the weekend. So we just tie the two together. Okay. Not okay. too much pushback on it. Nobody gives me a hard time with it. And they seem to show for the most part. Good. I love it. Well, that is a great segue to my next part of expectations, and that's to be really proactive in tackling your meeting challenges. So what happens if someone is late? You don't want to surprise them with any sort of punitive measure. And sometimes people need to be told how to behave. So real estate agents come to us from all walks of life. I regularly said, unfortunately out loud and to myself, where do we find these people? Long John Silvers, why, why do we have to tell them all of these things? And I had a girl once and she all, we started at nine and she was on my ISA team and she would roll in at 9.05, 9.07 every day. And it made me, it made me just so angry. And finally I sat her down in a one-on-one -on -one and I said, Heather, we start at nine, that's when you start getting paid. That means I want you to begin working at nine. So you don't have to come in 30 minutes early, but if your settling in routine lasts five to seven minutes, show up five to seven minutes early so that you can begin being paid for your work at nine. And she was mortified, you guys. She's just, she had no idea. She had no office experience prior to that. And she was on time from there on out, or if she was late, she would call to let me know. So keep in mind, we're all, everybody on this call is sort of in the upper echelon of the organization. And so the things that we take as second nature, they might need to be explicitly told. So if you need to lay out for your team, if you're going to be late, you need to communicate. So if the meeting starts at nine, you need to be here ready to go at nine. You don't need to be walking in the door at line because disruptions to your meeting can really derail progress. Uh, another thing I would do is, and, and these are just suggestions. You don't have to do any of these, obviously. But if we were meeting in person, I'd lock the door if, if it was a problem. And that, that seemed to only happen one time when they would come in and the door would be locked and I would just be fighting everything in my body to not look at the door because they're standing there, you know, looking around like, what do I do? And they would dissipate off and they, they wouldn't be late again. Um, what, what do you do if someone arrives late to your meetings? Do you lock the door? Do you not let them in? If it's a virtual meeting, what's your strategy there? Anything? If it's, if it's like three or four minutes and it's not like a routine, I let them in. If it's like 12 after, no, nah, you're not getting in. I just leave because, uh, you know, for the Zoom meetings, you got to admit everybody. I leave that on. It's not an open room. Right. 12 minutes after, 
Sorry, can't help you. I can't yeah. get into the room. <laughs> you were too late. Absolutely. So what if hap what happens if someone misses a sales meeting? My rule was that you could, we had a, the sales meeting every, the first and third Tuesday, so twice a month, and they could miss one a quarter. So it was sort of like an excused absence. If you were going on vacation, or if you had family in in town or if you just didn't feel like coming that's understandable you can miss one meeting a quarter if you missed more than that we're going to take you off leads or if it was an unexcused absence they didn't communicate about it i'm going to take you off leads until we until we communicate about what's going on so what rules do you have about missing sales meetings i know curtis takes them off of leads is there anything else anyone does maybe I don't, I don't have any rules. If they don't want to come, they don't have to. Okay. That's definitely. Well, before Anthony jumped in, I was going to say, listening to others, we're probably too lenient. We, if they have a valid excuse, we don't hold them extremely accountable for coming, um, but probably do need to do that more in the future because it's always repeat offenders that have a, a sick relative or their cat got hit by a car or something like that week in and week out. How and many? If I can expand on that, Josh, 100, it's always the same people. Mm -hmm. And it creates like a group think where at some point it turns into two people showing up to your meeting out of like a staff of 15. And you're like, this is an awesome feeling too. <laughs> you took an hour out of your day to, and, and it's not like a, you know, it's not a BS session where they're to coach just like a mastermind. It's the same thing. I could do other stuff than get stood up by my team. I got plenty of things on fire in the background right now. <laughs> Jump on any of it right now. <laughs> That's good. Another way to prep for your meetings is to have a plan for vendors. Vendors always want to spot at your meetings to get in front of your agents, but this can take up really valuable face time with them and coaching time. So some strategies for this are consider limiting the amount of vendors you have appear at your meeting. So maybe we only allow one a quarter. You can create a wait list situation. You can also schedule an independent meeting with a vendor and then open it up to your company and let only those who are interested RSVP and attend. So maybe you would say, hey, Joey, this is great. We don't have time for this at our sales meeting. So what I I'm going to do is send out a sign up sheet. We'll have it at a separate time. And then all of my agents who are interested in this can come. And sometimes, unfortunately for Joey in this mock situation, they might find that none of the agents really want to, you know, they don't want to be privy to that conversation. And they might say, oh, well, no one signed up. Say, oh, well, I'm sorry, no one's interested. Maybe we'll try again in six months. And that leaves it up to the agent to have it be an elective thing, because that's that's a very very good lead generating activity for vendors and they they're asking for it frequently and sometimes you just don't need to hear about the custom knives that you can get your clients or you know whatever so that can be done virtually or in, in person depending on your structure so you can suggest to them while well, being happy for you to offer us a webinar at you know at this time so long as it doesn't interfere with any standing meetings or you can have vendors come to your social events to network with your agents and share information in a more casual setting. All right. Is there any, that's the end of my prepping for sales meetings. Is there anything y'all do that you prep for your sales meetings that I, we haven't covered yet? All right. So One now, thing that we found regarding timeliness is that I mentioned that we start at 945. We open up the conference room at 945. We don't actually kick off our meetings until 10. So we give folks that 15 minutes to kind of trickle in and, um, you know, meet and catch up on anything that they wanted to talk about, eat, grab coffee, that kind of thing. And that way, that 15 minute window, we don't want to be looking up for the rest of the hour after that and see people stuffing their faces and not engaging the entire time. So that 15 minute window, they have to kind of have a second breakfast and catch up with the team. Nice. I like that. And that would be a good, uh, obviously that's a short amount of time, but if you had a vendor, you could have them show up at 930 and they could bring donuts or breakfast sandwiches and hand out business cards and flyers during that, you know, sort of ease in period. And that way it's not taking away from the, uh, from the meat of your meeting. Uh, so speaking of the meat of our meeting, 
we, I want to talk about some things you can do during your sales meetings, and you're not going to have time to do each of these things, but I put together sort of a menu of items that I would suggest regularly pulling from because these were really successful with my team and I. So first is the sharing of wins. And this could be a quick open table for anyone to share anything that they want to celebrate with the team. It's something very positive that you can do. And it's pretty, they don't have to prepare for this. I would also allow for personal wins here. For those who aren't major producers or aren't producing yet, it gives them a chance to get to know the other people on the team. Sorry, my mental train derailed for a second. It gives your team members a chance to get to know one another. So if you're like, hey, my, my kid did this, or I did this, or I reached this personal goal, it's it allows them to have a voice and it doesn't just hold that space for your top producers. So it sort of levels the playing field. And it's also a great idea when they are sharing their wins, if you're in person, to get them to stand up to share. That helps Helps them get their energy level up and it helps them sort of have a, a better voice while they talk about it. Another thing to cover in your meeting are the challenges overcome or your lessons learned. So in most cases, there's a situation that you've helped an agent with since the previous meeting that could be a really great coaching tool for everyone. So before the meeting, ask this person, is this okay to share? And then either you or the agent, if they're comfortable, share what happened and what they learned from the situation, because that gives them a really great chance. And that's part of the beauty of the sales meeting and getting together and a good reason for you to come to the office is learning about situations and how you would handle them because it's highly likely that they're going to encounter the same thing or something similar and if they even have a general direction on how to handle it they're going to be of much better service to your clients and encounter a lot less stress if they feel like they know how to navigate it. All right, so another topic to cover are your client objections. Did yeah. anyone speak to a potential client since our last meeting and you got an objection that they didn't know how to handle? What I used to do is have a very small bistro table set up at the front of the room with two chairs. And during meetings, if someone had an objection that they didn't know how to handle, I'd say, that's great, come up here and have a seat. And then we would take turns and a little line would form and we'd take turns sitting at the other side of the table and we would role play it out. So it's another great way to keep the energy up. It gets them to engage in it. And it's also a, a good way to help them remember it. Because if we're just calling out the answer, people will go, oh, that's good. And they'll write it down. But if they see it played out in real time, that's going to put it in their brain a little bit more deeply so that they, they remember it better. Another thing to include in our sales meeting is sales training. Now, this might be super obvious, but you have no idea how many sales meetings I've sat in on where sales was never directly spoken about. So having a strong menu of items to train on sales-wise is really key. So the topics that I would train on for sales regularly in meetings are strategies to connect with leads, what to text, what to email, how, how and when to call, or things that you've said recently that have worked. Prospecting strategies within follow-up boss. How to identify the most promising leads. This would also include how smart lists work and tutorials on how to build your own smart lists general follow-up best practices. How many times do I call someone? How many times do I text someone? What To what lengths do I go to follow up with someone before I leave them out to nurture? How to read, understand, and share information from national and local market reports with potential clients. Take out your local reports and go through them and teach them how this is what this means. If it says this, that's what it means for your clients. And then role play out to them. Here's how I would present this information to clients. 
Another great topic to cover is building rapport at buyer and seller client meetings. What do you do with your body language? How do you behave? How do you connect with people in person versus the phone? These behaviors are learned and a lot of our agents don't they don't teach this in real estate school, so we need to teach it to them. So do you ring the doorbell or do you knock at a listing appointment? When do you set your bag down? How do you tour the house? And what questions do you ask the buyer and seller and what not to comment on? How do you engage both people, if there's two people there presenting the house to you at your listing appointment, how do you engage both of them? Uh, you know, how things to avoid, like if you walk into the kitchen, you don't automatically turn to the female and go, well, tell me about your kitchen. The, those types of things, those, um, those inherent biases that we have, and we all have them. Let's talk about those a little bit so that we know how to behave and we're not killing <laughs> killing our, our appointment in, in the bad sense. Other sales things to train on. What do you do when a lead stops responding to you? Advice on that. Strategies to better connect with your leads and build rapport over the phone and via email different buying styles and personalities of clients and how to interact with them, handling objections or challenges and what to say, and then role-playing it out. That's another great place for that bistro table. And you can also do that online if you hold your meetings via Zoom. How to be more present and be a better listener to your clients so that they feel heard and understood. This is something that we're talking a lot more now in the new way of sales because before when you would attend a sales training and I'm not talking before as in two years ago but maybe 10 years ago it was sort of how how you manipulate them how you trap them into saying yes or something like that now our training is much more about it's not our parents sales training this is about truly understanding people listening to them and making sure you are truly working in their best interest. And so a lot of, you know, even as we're growing up, even though we might be younger and not in sales, we learn about these tactics, tactics from our parents and our guardians and whoever. And we have this perceived notion of what sales should be. And then when we go to apply it to our, our own leads, we're going about it the wrong way. So actively talking about that is really, really helpful. Some other topics, prior, prioritization, how to prioritize sales leads. So how do I know that I need to talk to Josh more than Joey? What determines that? What behaviors are they doing that signals that to me? That's really, really something that a lot of people don't understand. Story time, let's share something that happened recently, whether it worked or it didn't how you handled it and what you learned from it, how to ask for referrals and when to do it, working with first time buyers or sellers and how that differs from people who have been through the process, working and if communicating with listing agents. This is really something that will move the needle forward for your team if you you talk about it often. So even if your structure is, hey, we've got 50 agents, but only these four are, are allowed to go on listing appointments, that's fine. Talk frequently about how to work, how do I work with this listing agent? How do I communicate with them? What are they looking for in my language, in my contracts, in the presentation of an offer, that's going to help your buyer agents secure more transactions because they're going to tune their brain to how to speak with listing agents. When my husband and I were just a husband and wife team, he handled all the listings and I worked with all the buyers. And I became this powerhouse of a buyer's agent because a, he talks on speakerphone all the time, you know, those types, exclusive speakerphoners. And so I heard both sides of his conversations day and night. And I knew because of hearing both sides of that conversation, I knew exactly what they were looking for. They being the listing agents. I knew the because he would call the buyer's agents. Well, what about this? What about that? How, you know, he was heavily vetting these offers. So I knew how to present my offers in such a way that there were no questions.
questions from the listing agent. So even if that's the structure for your team, that's going to really help them build their toolkit and become stronger buyer's agents, even if they're not interested in listing any homes. A couple more items that you can train on for sales, building your personal brand and your social media online presence. Even if you have a very strong media and marketing presence with your brokerage, this is something that every agent needs to learn how to do on their own. What's appropriate, what's not, the right mix of personal and professional, that type of thing. How to work with investors, that's another great topic. Confidently navigating inbound versus outbound calls. Practicing your elevator pitch. Does every person on your team have an elevator pitch? How do they quickly show value in social settings or on the fly? This is something that would be really great for them to practice just as much as a buyer presentation or a listing presentation. And last, how do you get a file from contract to close and hold it together when things get sticky? So obviously you can't train on all of those in one, in one meeting, but that's a great list of topics to get you started when you're specifically talking about sales and how to get them to perform better. Some other topics I would suggest hitting on in your sales meetings are overall business management. So as we hit on earlier, agents come to us from all kinds of backgrounds and they all want not all, but most of them come into real estate wanting to be, I want to have my own business. I want to be an entrepreneur. And they have no idea how to run or even manage a business. So teaching them how to treat their book of business like a business, like it's their business, help them be more productive, stay in the business longer. So approaching your work, how to manage your time and your calendar establishing healthy boundaries and staying in control of your business. How do you handle a full pipeline and multiple files? Everybody's scrambling. There's so many different types of hard in real estate. It's the hard of, I'm trying to build a business. I don't have anything going on. And then it moves to, oh, I have all these files and I don't know how to manage it. I don't know how to manage getting them to the closing table and prospecting for new clients. So how do you handle that full pipeline? Ways to visualize your work either on whiteboards or on your computer so that you can see your pipeline at a glance and know where everyone is in the process so fewer things slip through the cracks. So this, as good as follow-up boss is or sky slope or broker mint, there hasn't been my dog's making a noise. There hasn't been a, a dashboard that shows that. shows that. So and if someone knows about that, uh, what they use, please drop it into the chat or tell us what they use because it getting them a personalized way to navigate their process with their work. So there's going to be something that I forget every time that Bridget doesn't. So if there's a checkbox you always have to look for or whatever, those types of things on some type of visual is going to help them hold their deals together much better. And just flat out knowing what work and efforts are needed to hit the goals that are set. So let's reverse engineer. If your goal is to sell 30 houses in the next year, do they know how many days they need to work, how many calls they need to make, how many appointments they need to have, conversations that lead to appointments? Do they know the exact recipe to hit those 30 transactions? And so covering things like that and teaching them how to run it as a business is really going to help you along. Another item to cover in your sales meetings would be your reviewing your progress and goals. So you want to mention your overall team and brokerage goals, but really try to keep this at the agent level. Your brokerage goal or your office goal isn't a big motivator for the individual agent. They're worried about keeping food on their table and their bills paid. They don't really care about the overall team goals. So have a way to share this information that keeps it on an evil playing field. I really like to use percentages. So Curtis is at 45% of his goal. Way to go. Johnny's at 75% of his goal. Way to go. So 
if you use the specific numbers, so if Curtis is whatever I said to his goal and he sold 100 houses, but Johnny's at 75% of his goal and he's only sold 30 houses, that that's helpful because it for a lot of people, those top producers are an unattainable goal and they are never going to beat them on the leaderboards. They're never going to have the visibility that those people have. And it can be really defeating if you're trying to position that as a motivator for them. So setting them up where someone who's probably never in a million years going to sell a hundred houses a year has sort of a chance to get ahead of that top producer on the scale sometimes. That's going to do two things. That's really going to motivate the newer person who you're trying to push to do more so they can meet their goals. And it's really going to meet motivate that top producer because, man, it's going to burn them up that a newer person's ahead of them. So that's going to help everyone involved. You can ask an agent who's figured something new out. So whether that be technology-wise or just in general in the transaction in your specific market, they could share that or overcome a challenge recently. Have them teach on the topic to the group. This is gonna mix up the voices being heard and allow these people who are interested to maybe have a spotlight for the time. And if you're growing your team, it helps you identify potential future leadership as you grow your team. So are they comfortable and effective in coaching the group? If so, maybe you can give them a little bit more responsibility. They can head up a committee or something like that. If you don't have a position available on your team yet, you can give them little things to do and champion. That way, when a position is open, you can easily move that them in there and they have more and more experience leading others. Because just like your agent bench, we always need to be filling our agent bench, but we also need to be filling our leadership bench because we sort of assume our leaders are going to be around forever. And when your sales manager leaves or your team lead leaves, uh, you could be really left in a lurch. So be making sure that you're looking out for the, the leaders that you can groom up to take someone's place. Or as you grow, you might have another position open that you can do it. Another topic to cover during your meetings are your current marketing campaigns. Do your agents know what you're pushing out to the public at the company level? Do they know what to say when someone calls in asking about your guaranteed offer program or some type of special something that you're running? Making sure that they're coached to confidently handle any inquiries about your marketing is really key because you don't want to waste your marketing. If you have a phone number on that billboard or flyer that you put out and they call and someone is unfamiliar with it, or they don't know what to say, you're wasting your marketing dollars and efforts. So make sure they know, hey guys, here's the special we're running. Here are the dates that it's running. Here's the number we put on it. And when someone calls asking about this, here's what you say. Um, and other things to think about, can you turn any of your topics into a game to increase interaction? Uh, that's something that we always tried to consider, and we didn't do it as often as anybody would like. But and you don't want to turn everything into a game, but just to kind of mix it up a little bit. All right. And after the meeting, we want to make sure that we're following through on any action items that we set forth during the meeting. So make sure you're always closing the loop. There's nothing worse than saying you're going to do something and not following through. So this breeds distrust or worse. If you make a commitment, follow through or share why it ultimately wasn't a good idea at your next meeting. Go ahead and start your agenda for the following sales meeting while you have your brain tuned. So as soon as you get done with your meeting, I'm sure you're going to have, oh, this came up during the meeting. We need to cover this next time. They didn't really get this point, so I want to cover it again until we have full participation. Building this thoughtful agenda instead of deciding all the information to share the day before or worse the morning of is going to really help you present, present in your meeting. So for instance, this is a meeting uh, and I didn't prep for this this morning. <laughs> I put this together earlier last week. And then because I was thinking about it, I came back in and I added a few things and I changed a few things 
needs well before the meeting. Do the same thing with your meeting. You're making a presentation to your people even though they're required to be there. So you wanna make it worth their time and be as really as effective. And speak to your agents in between meetings about the things you covered during your sales meeting. So if you keep these topics front of mind, they're gonna be truly learning and implementing it because covering it once, it really just doesn't cut it. So make sure you're making it that reiterative learning process. All right. Well, that's all I could come up with about sales meetings. Uh, does anyone else have any ideas, things that they really do that work, that your agents really love? Is there a game that you play or a structure to your meeting that you've gotten some really great responses from? Does anybody want to share those? Ooh, Curtis has something. I like talking about my meetings. It saved me a lot of time. So instead of me getting pelted from 50 angles a day with the got a minutes, yes. coaching the agents to know when they call me or they call my girlfriend, who's basically doing co-team runner with me, mm -hmm. can this question wait till tomorrow's huddle so the whole team can benefit from the explanation? Blah, blah, blah. Here's a speech about shared genius. And of course, I may not have the answer. It's gotten a lot of buy-in. And then my phone does not try to murder me every day. Yes. Knock on wood. So that's been a, a great redirect. It took a while to coach it in. And of course, the accountability with making sure, you know, you're showing up on the meetings or you're not, or the, you know, sales huddles every day, or you're not getting your leads. Right. So it's done a lot to kind of take a lot of that nonstop barrage of just all day long, just managing every single deal, every question, anything that goes wrong in the database, et cetera, et cetera. So we keep that one short. We're on at nine. We're done at 915 religiously every day, except for the day that we actually have an actual real deal sales meeting. So that's great. And that, I bet the biggest hurdle of that when you first started was you staying firm in that boundary, right? Because exactly. it's so easy easy to get what well, I know the answer you know and and we have this immediate culture of if I text you I should hear something back right away or I need an answer right away so it's really hard to fight that urge my clients my clients trained me like that a long time ago where that text <laughs> comes in you answer it immediately because it's right in front of you so the agents yeah. do the same thing but now you got 10 agents asking you 50 questions for their 28 for their 20 clients and yeah after a while you're you're drowning yeah, exactly. So that's helping you batch your work, but that the hard work on your end is staying firm in that boundary, even though, you know, yeah, it'll take two minutes. minutes. Most of it's a two minute answer. Yeah. Two minutes times 40 is equals your day is crap. Basically. Good. <laughs> Anybody else have anything that's really working for them that you'd like to share? Something I'll share that we don't do a lot of, but it was really neat to do in one of our meetings was uh, Slideo was the app. So the agents had a QR code. They scanned a QR code, get them into an app. We could answer, they could, we could ask them questions. They could answer it. And it was broadcasted on a screen and it started giving us different graphics of percentages. Like, what do you want to focus on in your business? Was it farming or open houses or database? And it would start clustering these things with all kinds of different graphics. It was really neat. I actually saw it in a conference in Vegas and we brought it in. It was really cool. And then it would cluster them together. Like if there was 15% of the people were focusing on this or 20% on that. So it just gave it a really cool visual effect to some of the questions. And I think got the agents more participant participating in answering the questions versus like trying to raise their hand or, or contribute, you know, even you know, chatting in on a zoom. So that was really cool. Yeah. Good. Uh, I've seen that before and it is really effective, especially, you know, in your virtual settings. We used to play for, and this wasn't real estate related, but there's a treasure trove of minute to win it games. So you can get uh, you know, stuff at the Dollar Tree or probably stuff you have laying around your house. And they're very short games and they're easy to understand. So again, I wouldn't do it every meeting, but if you're looking to, you know, create something engaging, those are pretty quick and they're designed. So for any abilities, you, you know, you won't have to pick the fittest people in the room to do a tug of war or something. It's something anyone can do. What were you going to say, Johnny? 
I was going to say that was a really great run through of everything you could think about for uh, sales meetings. <laughs> I took I took a whole bunch of notes. <laughs> Thank you. And, yeah, because well, there's different types of meetings too. It's like ah, there's do I have an agenda for some? I have sales trainings. I have a huddle. I've, we have company meetings. That it's a whole company, you know. Mm -hmm. And do we share it ahead of time or do we not? Do we wish we could? Was it prepared enough ahead of time to share it? So there's a lot of things um, that go into into that. Um, and uh, we're kind of we we don't we're not real rigid. We should be more rigid in some areas, but we're pretty open door with the you know coming in and out into the meetings. Just show up, get there. There's there is you know, reinforcement behind making sure that they show up and it's usually the repeat offenders and I just kind of have to have like a one-off chat and it's just like, I'm sorry, we'll, I'll get straightened up. It's usually that, you know, um, it's not like we have to do too much reprimanding. Um, so the good people, but yeah, great. That was a great run through everything. Oh, awesome. Man, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it, it always frustrated me because we, we had eight offices and so I, part of my visits were, I would go to the Yes, I can share the notes for sure. I was going to offer that because I was a lot of rattling off of topics, but I will be happy to um, see you, Joey. See you next week. Uh, so just really quickly, we had eight offices and I would visit the offices on sales meeting days because everyone was required to the, come to the office and I would therefore get to see most of the agents on those days if I plan my visits around them. And oftentimes during the meeting, I mean, they would be covering everything. Hey, we're, we ran out of coffee and no one replaced it and this and that. And then by the end of the meeting, there was just, there was no sales. And I'm like, we, we could have coached them on, you know, how to do something. They're relying on us to teach them how to reach their goals. And so having that, if you take away one thing from our time here together is if it's a sales meeting, sales and sales strategies needs to be at the forefront of it. Leave everything else to another time. And if you would need, if there's a house, if there's a problem or a housekeeping meeting, that could be a separate meeting, but make sure that you are hitting them hard with the, the actionable items. That's something that really resonates with people. Like when I send out my newsletter or I coach on something or whatever, the biggest feedback I get is always, you gave us very specific things to do. So I want you to, to encourage you, whether you're talking to an agent or you're talking to a client or anyone and you're encouraging them to do something, tell them how to do it. <laughs> Dig that level deeper, tell them how to do it and then come back with more. All right, guys, in the spirit of starting on time and ending on time, that's it from us today. Thank you so much for being here. I will email you all some notes and we'll have the recording. See you next week. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Thanks.